Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Perino, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Committee on Public Information. On the 13th of April 1917, President Woodrow Wilson signed Executive Order 2594 establishing the Committee on Public Information. This committee was established exactly one week after the United States entered the First World War in order to generate popular support within the country for engaging in the war in Europe. The Committee on Public Information was composed of the Secretary of State, Secretary of War, Secretary of Navy, and was headed by a civilian chairman. The chairman of the committee appointed by President Wilson was a young reformist named George Creel. George Creel was a young muckraker journalist whom prior to becoming chairman of the committee was best known for his work in newspapers in Cal Kansas and Colorado, his work to support the reform of child labor, and his support of women's suffrage. He also made a brief appearance as the police chairman in Denver, Colorado, where he was quick quickly labeled a crackpot by many citizens after he deprived officers of guns and nightsticks. Creel was a true socialist of his time. He believed in equal opportunity for all, regardless of gender and race. As a writer and journalist, he believed that informing the average citizen with accurate information would allow them to create ideas of their own and allow them to engage in debate, in return creating more positive, long-term impacts for democracy and our country. Above George Creel's ideals of socialism was his sense of patriotism and doing what he thought was right for the future of our country as a whole. When George Creel was in high school, Woodrow Wilson made a visit to his school and delivered a speech on democracy. This speech touched Creel closely, and it was from then on that he would become a die-hard Wilson supporter. In 1916, George Creel wrote a book in support of Woodrow Wilson's run for his second presidential term. Wilson won the election with the campaign slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. The war in Europe was a conflict far from the interest of the American people. A vast majority were in support of staying neutral and letting Europe fix its own problem. After Wilson's second inauguration in January of 1917, due to the state the, the war was playing out to be, he knew that he would have to join the Allies in the war effort in order to ensure an ally victory. But he also understood that joining a war in which a large majority of citizens wanted no pardon would cause many troubles militarily and domestically. The Wilson administration, administration's solution to their problem was the creation of the Committee on Public Information, and Wilson considered none other than George Creel for the position of chairman. The committee's initial goal was to sway the public's opinion in favor of joining the war effort in Europe. This was no easy task. They used a number of different methods to shift the public's opinion, but all the methods centered around filling each citizen with feelings of nationalism and patriotism. The Committee on Public Information had 20 subdivisions with offices internationally. The Division of News created a government-ran newspaper that was released daily, called the Official Bulletin. Thousands of these government newspapers and pam pamphlets were circulated every day in an attempt to inform and encourage the citizens to support the war. 75,000 men were trained to give speeches written by the CPI regarding buying bonds, registering for the draft, and other ways in supporting the war. These men were coined the four-minute men, as a majority of them would give these short speeches in theaters during the time it took to change the reels of film. Ironically, most likely during a film that was also produced by the CPI. They did not only give speeches at theaters, but also at churches and other places the community gathered. It is said that these 75,000 men gave about one million speeches to about 400 million people in the two years of the committee's existence. George Creel was a visionary. He understood that in order to sell the war to the people, he would have to use imagery and play off the imaginations and emotions 
of the average citizen. He also understood that the two best forms for communicating to the masses were the advertising industry and the public schools. Creel's main message that he was trying to invoke in people was clear. America's military has good intent and is fighting for the protection of the world. With the potential of imagery in mind, Creel appointed a popular celebrity illustrator named Charles Dana Gibson to head the Division of Pictorial Publicity. The Division of Pictorial Publicity hired a number of talented illustrators to produce wartime propaganda posters. They also worked with advertising agencies and artists to ensure control of the messages being made to the public. The, di the Division of Pictorial Publicity and other departments of the CPI used psychological methods in their images and films. They believed by suggesting a citizen may be unpatriotic, it would give them a motive to be more patriotic. The Division of Pictorial Publicity produced posters that invoked Im imagination and feelings into people, as opposed to the previous normal stating facts about the war effort. After some months, posters in the cities were so similar that it was hard to distinguish between a government-produced poster or a civ civilian advertiser. One of the most famous posters from this era is the Destroy This Mad Brute poster. This image shows an ape on the coast of America wearing a German helmet with a bloody club in one hand and a dress torn American woman in the other. Above it says destroy this mad brute and below enlist. The use of apes to characterize people was nothing new in this era. In this case, they characterized the German as an ape to portray the image of Germans as being brutal, savage, and destructive creatures that were hell-bent on world domination. They also carefully used this image so that German Americans would not be thought of when people viewed this poster. The imagery of the woman in distress was to appeal to young males showing Germans taking their woman would be sure to draw on the emotions of young males and encourage them to enlist to protect the people of their country. The posters produced were aimed at young men to enlist and fight in the war. Another popular poster from this time shows a young marine in front of a United States flag standing tough like Teddy Roosevelt with one simple line of text at the bottom reading, Be a U.S. Marine. The tone and purpose of this poster was to invoke feelings of heroism and the glory of war in young males in order to enlist. In comparison with the brute poster, it gave the citizens an image of their enemy depicted in a terrible manner while the Marine poster created an image in their head of the heroic protector of democracy against the Germans. All of the posters held the same theme of racism towards Germans and sexism towards females to enable males to enlist. Public Information established the Division of Civic and Educational Cooperation as their second main method for reaching the masses. The goal of this division was to push patriotism into the school curriculum. Schools across the country were forced to integrate lessons written by the Committee on Public Information. They issued 105 publications, reaching nearly three-quarters of the U.S. population. These publications given to schools included lessons on patriotic and unpatriotic culture, mainly enforcing America's role in the frontier and in the world. The Division of Civic and Educational Cooperation deliberately placed stereotypes of other cultures in their lessons as well. In one example, students were given an art assignment to draw groups of Native Americans. The assignments and instructions resulted in the children drawing Native Americans living like savage beings that knew nothing but war and the wild wasteland. The Division of Civic and Educational Cooperation also wrote plays about war and nationalism and recommended that the schools have students enact these plays. Although these students have never seen war, the purpose of this was to invoke images and feelings within the students of being in war and gain a sense of patriotism towards their country. Not every teacher and administrator accepted the harsh regulations set by the CPI, but the teachers that did fight back with free thinking and those who qu questioned the change in curriculum ended up being fired. 
With both media and education under the management of the CPI, Creel was able to reach the minds of Americans whether they were watching a movie, reading the newspaper, learning in a classroom, or even simply walking down the street. Creel's use of imagery and psychology was able to redefine what patriotism meant in America and created a sense of nationalism within the country with a call to arms. Patriotism no longer meant love for our country, but now meant the spreading and protection of democracy and being the protector of the world from evil. Creel's deliberate release of information and imagery deeply touched many of the citizens emotionally, and within his first year he was able to make an unpopular war popular. Although George Creel had succeeded in selling the war to the American people, his committee continued to work up until the end of the war. What once started as a propaganda agency to draw support for the war had ended in what seemed to be a censorship committee. After U.S. declaration into the Great War, Congress passed the Espionage Act, Trading with the Enemy Act, and later the Sedition Act. These bills were made to combat communication and business dealings with the enemy. On the forefront, these bills seem to be made to work against enemy spies and sympathizers, but the language used in these bills allowed for the government to monitor, censor, and prosecute those that they felt were using language that is considered hostile towards the United States. Although George Creel and the CPI did not have the authority themselves to prosecute individuals, they were able to recommend individuals they needed dealt with to the proper authority. The boundaries of the First Amendment were being crossed, and many argued that it was completely disregarded, as people were being prosecuted based on nothing more than the words that they spoke. On the 11th of November, 1918, the armistice was signed, ending the Great War. As the war in Europe came to a halt, the Committee on Public Information also ended its affairs in the United States, although they remained active internationally until August of 1919. As time went by after the war, the reputation of the Committee on Public Information rapidly declined possibly from soldiers who spoke of the true horrors of the war, or the fact that many Americans associated the CPI with censorship, or maybe because they were now not afraid to speak out against the Committee on Public Information after they earned back their freedom of speech. After the Committee on Public Information's dissipation, George Creel would go on to deny using or supporting any kind of censorship. During World War II, he applied for a position within a propaganda department and was declined. The Committee on Public Information succeeded in its initial task and became a model for future administrations on shifting public opinions.